Hey folks, David Stewart here. I apologize in advance if this video seems a little bit more rambling than my normal videos. It's not as well thought out as things usually are. It's not like an encapsulated piece of ideology that I'm presenting to you. I really want this to be a bit of a conversation starter and I want to give you a couple of ideas and a couple of things that have been um, floating around. I've been talking about a lot with other people on YouTube and outside of YouTube. And um, what I think I've been able to see um, as I, as I step back is a common thread that's gone through a lot of the discussions that we've had on this channel, a lot of the philosophical discussions, political discussions, movie discussions that have been going on on this channel for the last year, all the way from, uh, you know, the Star Wars fanboy hate, uh, the sports fandom, even through, you know, demonetization of YouTube videos, censorship of YouTube videos, uh, copyright strikes, um, talk about political systems, talking about political upheaval, um, you know, the role of government, even beyond the stuff that we've talked about on this channel. I think um, the common thread that goes through all of that is actually community. And I'm going to use the word community. Um, another word you might be able to use, but it, it's got a little bit more attached to it is like tribe or clan. Um, but I think of community first and foremost. And what does community have to do with all this stuff? Um, and what does it have to do with the internet in particular? Um, community is, uh, I think, something that's really, really essential to um, human existence and the nature of humans. I think we're social creatures. I don't think we're antisocial creatures. And uh, I think throughout human history, we've always lived in communities, whether that's like an organization of related family members, like a clan, or if it's like a city or a township or something like that. There's always been an organization of community, of, of social structure that enforces norms and um, promotes particular kinds of behaviors, maybe even virtues, depending on what society you're looking at. Um, executes whatever the concepts of justice are or prevents people from having bad behaviors. That to me is all part of community. And, and what it has to do with all this other stuff is um, that I think a lot of the bad things that we see in our world and a lot of the things that we object to are the result of a breakdown in community of some kind. And some of the good things that we've gotten on the internet, I think, is a rise of community, and some of the bad things we've had on the internet is the destruction of community. Um, so if we go back to, you know, if we take like a little bit of a, of a trip back in time um, to when everybody lived in fairly close-knit towns, um, you didn't have a lot of need for something like, for instance, welfare, uh, just as an example, and you also didn't have as much need for something like insurance. I know this will sound weird, but hopefully you'll you'll uh, follow me with this, is that um, if somebody in your community was in need, uh, you would probably help them, especially if they were like a deserving person in need, if they weren't like a deadbeat, right? And so people who were part of a community had a really strong incentive to be a beneficial contributing member of that community because they might have something bad happen and they might get sick, they might get hurt, and they might need other people to help uh, care for them when they can't care for themselves. And the community just sort of as a group, just like how you work in a family, it's like a big extended family, um, takes care of people in need until they can care for themselves. Likewise, if something really bad happens, like somebody's house burns down, you, know, you people in the community, they get together, they help that person maybe buy a new house or build a new house or whatever they need, uh, whatever needs to happen. And uh, somewhere along the way, at least in the United States, and I can't speak for, of course, I can't speak for every country. This is a little bit of an American centric view, but I think um, as goes America, as so goes lots of other places. It, it, certainly as people are more freely moving about and moving outside of their communities, I think we're going to see community breakdown. But I see a, break, a breakdown in that concept of community in the United States. And I think there's a couple things that contribute to that. And um, I think the, the biggest one is is actually that women are no longer in the home in the numbers that they used to be you know, 50, 60, 100 years ago. Uh, women are out in the workforce um, earning money and uh, paying taxes. Uh, I think that that's um, a bit planned, right? You know, hey, you now you can work outside the house. Great. Now you can pay, now that family can pay twice as many, uh, twice as much tax um, on whatever they're doing. So that's my, my part of my view on it. But when women are not in the home, the, the house is empty during the day, right? Where, how can you build community in a physical location if women are not there to build a community? Women, 
have always been the community makers. I think they've always been more. And if you, you know, I, I don't want to generalize all women, obviously, but I think women in general are more aware and more interested in maintaining good social bonds with other people than men are. Uh, men are more competitive. Women are more pro-social. And I think that has to do with our different natures. And I don't think that that's a bad thing because men have to go out and they have to um, fight for survival to provide for their fight for their young and their family. Women have to nurture relationships in their community for the reasons that we talked about before because it's really hard to raise children all on your own. And if you have not had children yet, trust me, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, having family, having friends that are involved in that process, that's gonna make it a lot easier. So as women have left the home in the United States, community has started to break down. You have a neighborhood of empty houses. You know, um, my wife stays home most of the day and we have a community of like retired people. So we have a little bit more of a community in my particular area than um, probably lots of other people have elsewhere. But still, it is, um, there's still a lot of empty houses during the day. And I think if you go to certain neighborhoods where, you know, everybody's like part of that two income household, and I think you're going to, I don't know where the sweet spot is. I'm, I'm trying to remember some statistics off the top of my head, but there's a sweet spot in the American middle class where um, basically both people have to work to pay the tax um, that's due. Essentially, you, you end up in a very kind of, you end up in a situation where it's it's you have a house, but it's hard to pay for, so both people work, but more of that income gets, gets sent away to taxes because you're generating more. And so you end up in kind of a hard spot where it's hard to, hard to save and hard to get ahead. And a lot of people kind of end up there until their income potential grows a little bit and they can, they can sort of move ahead. Uh, but that two income trap, you hear about the two income trap a lot in American media. And that's really what it is, is that um, taxes and expenses are so high. And expenses, part of expenses are taxes are high. A lot of people are unaware of all the taxes that they happen to pay. They think income tax is the only tax we're talking about. They don't think about property tax, like capital gains tax, sales tax. Um, they don't think about payroll tax. Most of you people who receive uh, like a W-2 don't realize that there's a portion of your paycheck that you never even see reported because your employer is paying tax on your behalf. And if you've ever filed for a self-employed tax in the United States of America, you'll know that you have to pay that extra like 12.5% uh, of tax, which is your payroll tax that your employer would have been paid, uh, would have been paying on your behalf that you never even saw. That's wages that you didn't get. So let me be a little bit political there. Payroll tax is something that's, bit, that's paid for by employees, not corporations, because corporations are not people, despite what... Uh, particular court rulings. Corporations are not people. Only people are people. Only people can pay tax. Um, so anyway, that's where I think the big breakdown of communities happen. I think it's also happens in a couple of other ways. I think children uh, no longer grow up and remain in whatever community that they're in. Like those social bonds have kind of broken down in America. There's this expectation um, in my culture that uh, kids will grow up, uh, you know, get to 18, move away and go to college and basically like never come home. And if you live in uh, like a smaller town, which is where you would think community would be the best, uh, there seems to be a lot of push to kids to like go out and like, I don't know, do something different in the world other than stay and be part of their community. And a lot of people come back and a lot of people don't come back. Certainly I've had a lot of friends that left their particular um, home location and never came back to their original community. And I don't know if it's been good or bad for them, but I do know most of those people, this is of course anecdotally, most of those people didn't end up having a family. They end up sort of being like the new American uh, nomads, if you will, that kind of move from town to town and take different jobs. And uh, I don't know if they're, if they're super happy with those lives or not. That's not the point. The point is that they're not part of the community, like building, building the community. So I think that's another thing that's, that's broken down the community. The third thing is, um, and I don't know if this is a chicken or egg scenario, but the third thing is that all the things that the community used to do in America have been replaced by it's like some function of government, especially government of a larger nature than what would be local. So like your local government is run by like your neighbors um, and uh, they can't really just like pass laws on the people that they live with that are part of their community without suffering big social consequences. So there's kind of a social check on local politics, which is very, I think, beneficial to the people who live in a particular location. Um, uh, but a lot of the functions of the community, like charity and things like that, have been 
uh, in a sense, taken over by government action in the form of different kinds of um, assistance, like welfare. There's, uh, you know, there's housing assistance. There's government housing in places. There's housing allowances where they give people money to go find housing. Um, things like food stamps. Uh, now they have like EBT cards, which are even. Uh, you know, like they swipe a card and that's their food stamps. Um, there's a lot of public assistance that's out there. Now, a lot of the argument for for public assistance is that if you didn't have public assistance, like these people would be, they'd be shit out of luck, like they'd be starving. And um, I actually think that things would be worse. Like if you just, if you just like ripped the bandaid off of the modern welfare state, things would be pretty bad for a lot of those people because the community has been has broken down right if you went back 100 years and told people that we're gonna you know we're gonna have a government program that that provides for the needy and all this they're like well the church already does that and these people do that and there's mutual aid societies that provide insurance for people when like their their houses get flooded or burned down or whatever happens like uh in the community there's no need for that in a tight-knit community there's no need for for government to take on the role of charity um and I don't know if like government taking on the welfare role has reduced the community's capacity to care directly for people and be empathetic towards neighbors, or if it's like a like you create the government programs because the government or because the community was already breaking down prior to that. So I'm not sure which one came first, but I I I think that like they, they either happen simultaneously or the government have government programs start to happen a little bit before this i think it goes all the way back to like social security um so i think it's been a long process of slowly like replacing the functions of charity um with um the the functions of government and whether or not you're like a believer in the welfare state or not that's why i think um a lot of people are recognize that if you took away the welfare state people would suffer is because there's not a community to directly care for people and then of course the counter argument to most you know we need welfare to care for the needy is like if you want to care for the needy go care for them um if if there's somebody in need in your community go help them um if somebody's hungry go feed them there's nothing preventing you as an individual from acting in a positive charitable way towards other people um but people are just so used to the idea of like a, a large government program providing that charitable action that they confuse the two ideas and, and you've also seen this um this little improper uh, like analogy you know improper i guess um equality that people talk about where they're like you know you can't say you're a christian if you don't support the welfare state if you don't believe in welfare if you don't want your money going to help the poor then you're not a christian and it's like that's not what it's about right christians are very charitable people and they really uh, want to help the poor but there's no choice involved in um in welfare right their money's being taken by them against their will and being given to people that they would not necessarily give that money to um, versus if you're in your own church family, like helping, maybe there's a needy family in your church and you're helping them directly. You're like, we're going to go help Bob and Sue. We're going to go buy them some food. We're going to go watch the kids while they work or something, right? Like that's that's like direct help of somebody who needs it. And I think Christians are really, really good at that. And to say that they're not Christians because they're not because they don't want to have their money forcibly taken from them and given to someone that they know nothing about and care nothing about and believe quite quite um, realistically that their money's not being used efficiently, that they're somehow like bad Christians for objecting to the welfare state. That's not a good equivalency uh, because welfare is not charity, right? It, it intends to replace charity, but it's not charity because charity is voluntary. It's, it's given of your own heart and your own free will. That's an important distinction. So those are the big three that I think have broken down the American community in the physical sense. Now, let's talk about the rise of the internet. Somebody asked me a while back to make a video on like the death of the internet, and I might extrapolate this idea just into a little bit of an idea um, video about this idea. So um, the internet, I think is a great thing. And I think it's a great thing because you are watching me on it and interacting with me on it. And I've uh, had some amazing experiences on YouTube as well as some very informative ones that might have been painful. It's it's all it's all part of the part of the good uh, experience. Um, the internet, I think, um, it revolutionized everything. But one of the best things about the internet, one of the things that people my age, who you know, in 30s or younger, uh, 40, let's say age 40 and younger, um, who really got to interact with the internet when they were young and the internet was young is that the internet provided community where there wasn't really community before. I certainly didn't feel like my neighborhood was anything 
nearing a community when I was a teenager, but there were online communities. There were forums built around, you know, there were there were like forums built around, you know, being a Metallica fan or something like that, that you could go on and meet people that had a really similar interest or maybe even a really similar set of, of values. There was a connection there. And then um, you through that social interaction, you eventually build a community. And for me, the best example of this is actually in the mid 2000s, which is uh, the rise of MMOs and gaming guilds and gaming guild websites. And if you played early days of World of Warcraft, this was definitely the case. And if you played EverQuest, this was definitely the case case before that is that uh, in these games you had guilds and you needed to have a guild to accomplish all sorts of things in the game and uh, in order to accomplish things in the game it required cooperation so you built these built these communities to accomplish that and to facilitate that cooperation and that was usually in the form of a guild some games had formal guilds some didn't world of warcraft had formal guilds and i believe everquest had formal guilds as well um and so what you do is you join the guild and you get on the guild website. So there'd be like a, a set of forums that you'd get on. And some guilds would actually require that you post a certain number of times on the forums every week in order to like maintain your standing because they knew that you posting and interacting with other guild members was how they were going to build a community. It's how people were going to get to know you, care about you, figure out what your goals were and help you to achieve your goals, which in turn was going to help the guild, right? So I had some really, really strong connections with people in early World of Warcraft, and I'm sure other people have similar experiences in that game or other games. Um, EverQuest was probably even better than that because the entire community of EverQuest you can interact with to uh, accomplish certain things. So um, I'll, I'll I'll make my brother-in-law make a video about getting his his epic paladin weapon because it's always quite a story. Is that no one knew how to get this weapon and all the paladins had to you know they got on the they got on the forums uh like the you know the the um the server forums or like the class forums that were run by uh soe and talked about what they were doing with the quest and what they were trying to figure out where they were trying to find uh, all the things because no one had done it before they had to cooperate and like pool their knowledge and pull their resources to try to try to you know, accomplish this epic thing. And now in World of Warcraft, you had to field 40 people in a raid, um, which required you to have this whole structure of community, this whole structure, uh, what some people called like a, a corporate guild structure. And for me, it was um, a really, really cool experience. I got to meet some amazing people. I met people from all over the world and I got to be good friends with them. I've even made friends on World of Warcraft that have been in my wedding or been in other We've, we've all been like in each other's weddings in a sense we've been to the weddings or been in the weddings and that sort of stuff um that that to me is like a really deep level of friendship and that community that team that existed was facilitated by a common goal with the game and was facilitated mainly by the internet by the fact that we could have these forums and go to them and interact with each other on these forums and then through that slow social interaction we built a community just like how back in the day Women built communities uh, in their neighborhoods by knowing, interacting, helping, and um, dealing with other women in the in the neighborhood. Men also built their own communities. Back in the day, there were also like you know the lodges, the you know like the Shriners, the base uh, Masonic lodges, and that sort of stuff. Men had their own way of building community too. But in terms of like that that neighborhood community, I think I think women were the were the creators of that, and um, and we we're missing that. You know, uh, we, we've we've lost that that female power in a, in a sense. We've lost that that bit of female virtue as we've we've made women leave the home. Um, that's that's my feeling about that. So, yeah, the internet created these amazing communities. Now, it didn't just create gaming communities. It created communities in lots of other places. There was there were communities on 4chan. There were communities on Reddit. Um, there were communities in all these different websites. But and YouTube. If you're watching this uh, this video, you probably are part of like what I would call like my YouTube community, like the community of, of people that watch my videos and talk to me, that watch other videos from um, similar minded people on YouTube and point me at those videos and I comment on those. Like there's a there's a little community here that's that's very organic. I think I think it's one of the good things about YouTube, and we don't have we don't have the best way of communicating with each other because we don't have like those forums, those guild forums. Um, but it's pretty cool. I, I think YouTube's pretty cool for that. So, um, but 
we've talked about monetization, censorship, copyright strikes, that sort of stuff. Um, that's breaking down the community a lot. And, um, you know, there's things that they do in World of Warcraft now. They have like a silence penalty and stuff. And that's because the community is broken down. Um, these online communities that arose that gave us such great connections because our our normal communities that we would normally have had as people 150 years ago have, have been sort of destroyed uh, culturally. These new online communities gave us gave us back that sense of purpose and connection that we really, I think, need as social creatures. And these in turn have started to break down because of a bunch of other factors and have upset a lot of people, made them feel lonely. And like the internet is not what it used to be. It's not the fun place it used to be. Um, I think um, the need for YouTube to try to police people's thoughts um, by demonetizing their videos, by banning them for bullying and that sort of stuff, all of the control of whether of what somebody says is controlled by the community that surrounds that person. So whether that's a virtual community or it's like a physical community, if we want to think back to like a physical community, you wouldn't have people walking around, you know, insulting every other person because they'd suffer negative social consequences. Um, likewise, if we had an actual community, it would be very good at policing itself, generally speaking. And actually, I think, I think the um, uh, maybe I'll call it like the I, I don't know what community to call it in YouTube. Maybe anti the anti like SJW community uh, or the rationalist community. Um, there's certainly a really good rationalist community on on YouTube. I think we are pretty good at at policing each other. So if somebody you know somebody does something that's like not quite right, people call them out on it. And then sometimes there's like uh, you know there's an apology, right? So like uh, I remember uh, Dave from Computing Forever did this video on like why Sargon was of Akkad was wrong and all these things and later he came out with an apology video because he felt he had acted incorrectly within the confines of this community to me that's evidence that you have a community that 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 really makes people want to make sure that they have those good social relationships and create some of the some of the policing of speech and stuff uh, in an organic way and, and I know some people will be like no police you know speech should never be policed well, it should never be policed by force and by the government, right? That's the idea of free speech. Um, but, but you choosing to restrict your your free your what, what you say based on your relationship with somebody, I think that that's totally valid. You know, I don't go I don't go around using racial slurs because I interact with people who aren't white every single day of my life, and I want to have a relationship with them that's good. And I also don't think of, I don't think those slurs, by the way. So it's not like oh, I mean. I'm internally a racist, but externally I'm not. Sideways thing, metaphysics. You know, thoughts don't exist; only your actions exist. Uh, I'll talk about that some other time. But I don't go around using this because I care about the people that are around me, and I care about what what uh, they think about me and what my relationship is with them. I need a community, and you know, I work in a very small, very tight knit, tight knit community, um, and I certainly. Uh, would not want to offend anyone in there or turn them off from me as a person because I I need them and they need me. That's part of part of community. So I think that uh, there are these little communities on YouTube and elsewhere that are very good at policing themselves. You don't really need any kind of external authority to come come down on that. However, um, that's not the, that's not true throughout all of YouTube. In lots of places in YouTube, like there's an old joke about how toxic the comment section are. Sex, comment section is go look at my force awakens video and you're going to see some toxic comments and that is a result of no community enforcement of anything um, and if you go to like a message board that's totally anonymous um like 4chan or something like that um you get to you get to really see what people think without any kind of social restrictions on them and sometimes it's kind of disturbing um but to me that's evidence of you know a lack of community as the community gets destroyed people have to step in. Now, you don't really need companies to censor you if you have community. Uh, you don't really need government to censor you if you have community. You don't have to worry about people being offended if you have community. Because if somebody's offended outside of community, uh, outside of your community, who cares? Because they have no impact on you. If somebody's offended within your community, that matters. And uh, I know I'm making like a basically a tribal case here, but it's really true. Like, who cares if some person... In, in like Boston hates me, right? They, they have no impact on my life whatsoever. Some person in Boston who's not part of any of my online communities hates me, who cares, right? Doesn't It doesn't matter at all. Um, what matters is if my neighbor hates me or if one of you guys hates me. Uh, that's, what, that's what really matters. So 
Um, anyway, that's my thoughts about that. I guess I'll wrap it up there. And I wanna know what you think about community. To me, that's the thread that goes through all this. Community serves as sort of the policing of things that are unpleasant, the policing of behaviors that we don't want. And as community breaks down, you start looking for more ways to enforce what the community used to do, whether it's through like corporate censorship, uh, demonetization, which is like a soft censorship, I guess, um, or it's through like government action, you know, replacing charity with things like welfare or government censorship of what people's thoughts are. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to think about with there. So, give me your thoughts about it. I really appreciate it. And um, my books. Please consider buying one of my books. By the time you see this video, Prophet of the God Seed will probably be live. That's my brand new hard sci-fi book. I really would appreciate it if you read it. If you want to support what I do and um, you generally like me or you just like sci-fi. I, I, I tried to write a good sci-fi story, so hopefully you like it. It's 99 cents on Amazon. And this week, running through this week, Muramasa Blood Drinker is free once again for a couple of days. So if you haven't picked up Muramasa yet, pick it up, read it, and uh, let me know what you think about it. I am very, very appreciative of your patronage and for you guys watching. Um, you guys have a great, great day, and please let's uh, develop some of these ideas, okay?